Hello everybody, today is the 9th of November 2022 and this is the Flux Dev Meeting. So just before anyone uh, forgets, please add to the agenda any topic you want to go over. We have a few things there, uh, but yeah, the more the better. So to go straight at it, let's go and cover the things that we finished in the last while. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Other now, otherwise, please shout. Um, so as we we talked, I believe on the last step meeting, we now have a bootstrap GA roadmap, which is due to you know first quarter next year. So for that, I updated the the board. So we now have a bootstrap GA board so you can actually track the things we're working towards GA quite easily. Um, so going through the ones that we've done, we have uh, some optimiz optimizations for the go -git. So, you know, especially at scale, we found a few issues and this is a follow-up from, from the previous one. So on average, if we go to the previous one, you know, during specific tests, which I think was doing five clones of one of uh, GoGit uh, fixtures, we were allocating about 30 megabytes per run. And then that reduced in total after these changes to 1.9. So, you know, that should make quite a reasonable impact. Um, but that, I think, well, we'll cover that on the, in one of the, the other agenda items as well. But that was already upstreamed, which is also really good. Uh, another thing that we be working on is to add force go git implementation uh, feature gates, and that will come in both source controller and image automation controller. So in the image automation controller, it has been merged yet, and for the source controller, uh, it's not, and that is one of the PRs on the. Um, list of things should be reviewed. Um, so the idea there is pretty much to do a soft decommissioning of libg 2 um, we, we, we talked quite a bit about this, but basically the reason there is libg 2 is not as stable, especially at scale. It panics the controllers, especially if they have a lot going on or big repositories. So what we, we're trying to do now is make sure that everyone is, um, you know, we're not going to break anyone's setup by implementing go git only and then if after the next release no one shouts we probably will um start considering how we with the commission and libg2 completely so that is that um so then a few changes from the flux cli and this i believe is to improve uh, some work on the Terraform provided, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think that's that's it. All right, and again, it's as as, as part of the the milestone because it touches the bootstrap, which is, you know, the the route that is going to um, in general. Well, in Q Q first. Um, another few things related to go git so we renamed the actual fork we have to flexity go git and the reason for that is that then we can stop referring to the upstream and then having to add a replacing to ours and now we'll pretty much just you know refer to our fork direct um, and a follow-up from that last change is actually changing on package and make sure that all the references now go to our go git implementation or fork rather than uh, upstream to honor uh, other changes around everything we're talking about here is git eh? <laughs> all right so um yeah another one is the support for cloning empty repositories before you will get an error trying to do this um and now you know it, it should be uh, absolutely fine on, on the next version. Um, yes, so this was actually a fix for an issue when we'd be actually using files. Um, 
So, it's, and I think this is to support uh, another ongoing um, PR, which is the refactoring of the Flux CLI to use the package Git. And basically, on that case, you, you might be using you know your actual known files in in your machine, and and because of that, we, we needed to make this change to to make sure that we're not going to overwrite your known files with a implementation of an empty byte. All right. Cool. I think those are the ones, uh, especially focused on, on boots, uh, Bootstrap GA. I think there are more here. We can quickly just go through them. Oh, yeah. So those are actually quite important ones, but are, are related to the image automation controller, which is not on the Bootstrap J. That's why it's not on the, the other board. And those two things are force push and, and pretty much have a you know, feature, uh, feature gauge to control the use of that. These will be enabled by default. Um, and this is the actual issue that links to that. Yeah, let me just... So th this is gonna be behind a feature gate, which is opt out. And the reason for that is it feels like this is the proper behavior. So if you are using image automation controller, you have a clone branch and you're pushing that into a separate branch. If that's, you know, separate branch is stale, we should not, um, you know, fail to commit um, the changes. Um, we, we should actually just force you know, that, that branch to be updated with the latest from uh, your clone branch plus the changes that we are making. Uh, but if for some reason someone wants to, to disable that, they have a feature um, feature gate for that. This doesn't impact the, the, you know, the clone branch at all, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, this is the, the feature gate you might need to use to disable this if you want it. Cool, yes, so we covered all those points. As I mentioned before, there are uh, a few PRs related to Bootstrap GA. If you have some time, uh, please go through them. I think that would be quite useful. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to, to talk about, which I think a lot of it is in my brain, some of these things I talked with uh, Sanskar as well, but I. I thought we should document it is <clears throat> all right. Why do we have our Flux CD Go Git fork? What are the features? What are the changes that block us from just using upstream? So I, I try to highlight here and pretty much I'm, I'm trying to go try to keep this up to date as we go. So there were the performance improvements, which I highlighted there, and these are the actually. Uh, PRs into upstream, so those are merged. And in terms of behavior changes, there are two things really. So the first one is on our fork, we remove two capabilities from unsupported capabilities, and those capabilities are multi-ACK and multi-ACK detailed, which are required for Azure DevOps. All right, so as soon as we we manage to get merged upstream a way to change those unsupported capabilities. You know, we, we can then support Azure DevOps with the up, upstream uh, version. A second uh, point so far in terms of changes in our fork is the auto population of host key algorithms, right? So at the moment, by default, we have, you know, goes default. Um, host key algorithms, we created some flags that users can set, but recently on Go Git upstream, they implemented an auto-populate feature, which is based on the known host provided. And the known host providers they, they work on is file-based. The problem with this approach is uh, they change it in such a way that we cannot switch off that behavior. So for most of our use of GoKit, we're providing that known host file based on a you know a byte array, uh, which means that you know we, we can't use the latest uh, of GoKit. If we do, it pretty much just breaks our implementation like completely. 
Um, so because of that, we reverted that change. I think I referred to that change right here. Um, so, you know, they're kind of forcing, well, actually here, sorry. They're forcing, um, you know, the config keys to be updated. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to find a way around this. Probably we need to either work on the new package that they are using, which is that schema no host or something on GoKit uh, upstream. So we need to work that out. Once those things are, are fixed, we we can, you know, decommission our fork and, and pretty much go upstream. I am not targeting this to any milestone. And the reason for that is we don't really need this to be GA. It would be great for maintainability and long-term, but these also might grow, you know, the dependencies we have on our fork might grow over time. So I'm not targeting that for, for GA as of yet, but this might change. Any questions around any of this? Nope, right. Cool, brilliant. All right. Um, and then in terms of like the Git repository kind uh, status, we've done well, a bunch of changes. Um, we are tracking, well, so, let me just get the prepare. Uh, yeah, so we, 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 prepare, we are preparing, sorry, um, a release which would include, you know, force go git across, across uh, search controller and an image automation controller, and also using the same version of go git on Flux CLI. The idea on this is pretty much confirm that everything works end-to-end -end across the entire you know, Flux ecosystem. Uh, once that is out, we'll be able to say, okay, we can decommission libg2, we can't, and we'll make decisions once that uh, take, uh, take place. But on top of that, uh, there are a few other things we're planning on around gates. There are not many in terms of like functionality or, or anything like that. Like the key things uh, are documentation, test coverage, and so on. So I have updated this with a lot of the work that Sunsky had done recently. Um, we still have like some gaps in terms of automation, but the majority of things are pretty much there. Um, I also removed some of the things we had here before, which was unrealistic. So for example, we don't need full um, Git protocol v2 support, um, and we proved that already. Uh, so instead of actually spending time to get that in place, we can pretty much just have our end to end with you know providers that require that, like uh, Azure DevOps. Um, another thing as well, I removed need for HTTP dump um, support testing because realistically, a lot of the providers we use and even the implementations we have don't have full support to that. So it felt a bit pointless. Um, so this is a bit more like focus on what we actually need. So this should be good. Um, right. Uh, another thing I wanted to cover around this is talking of Sanskar today, we, we agreed that one thing around GitHub repository kind or you know features which we're not 100 comfortable with for j is all the gpg touch points so that means the signing and verification um and both cases we need to kind of go through the implementation documentation and test coverage to make sure that we are in a good enough point for j and on top of that while we do that work we also make sure we, you know, the implementation is extensible enough to support, for example, SSH key signing that, you know, GitHub announced probably six months ago or something like that. Um, so yeah, so this is probably the biggest piece in terms of Git work that we have in, in the next, um, you know, until we are bootstrap GA. Um, and yeah, I think especially on the test coverage, we, we need to kind of 
put some attention on that. Any, any questions around that as well? Can you tell can you tell more about the use case about signing SSG? Sorry, what what do you mean? I mean, wh why do we why do we want this signing SSGs? Oh yeah, okay. So uh, at the moment, for you to sign your um, your your commits, what you generally have is you have a GPG key to sign it, and then you use your SSH key to push it, you know, back to, to your Git repository. Um, with this support, you could do both with a single key. So you can sign and interact with your Git repository having a single key that you need to, you know, rotate and so on. But again, like you can do that with a single key instead of having to manage and rotate two separate keys. Great, thanks. No worries. Uh, again, I haven't seen many people pushing for it. I think there is an, an issue that is quite old um, that you know one or two users uh, ask for it. But yeah, again, we will bear in mind that feature specifically. We want targets to bootstrap GA um, because we still have to see you know how difficult it would be to implement that and and so on. But the key thing is all the work we already have there, all the APIs we have that should support that you know that support uh, that implementation i would say cool um all right the last topic i wanted to cover i think i mentioned this in the past so overall we've we've been doing a great job at um eliminating class of vulnerabilities instead of just fixing specific instances of a vulnerability so for example we massively decrease um you know uh, execution of arbitrary um binaries by you know not shelling out as much as we did on flux v1 um and you know like a lot of decision design decisions we made when we started flux v2 uh kind of really founded this um this approach so one way to go a step further to that uh is pretty much to get kernel um, enforcement for our attack surface, which means we can reduce our attack surface even using a, you know, a, a base image that is not as, um, you know, like, not as small as it needed to be. So for example, instead of using a, a baseless or distroless um, base image, we can still use our Alpine, but block use of everything else just based on something like App Armor or SE Linux. So all my free time, I've been playing with this about for a while now, but only recently I kind of got it to a decent place. So at the moment it's, it's working for, you know, all the controllers. There are three specific features that are not working yet, which I plan to get resolved uh, soon. Uh, but what it does is pretty much limits access to all the things we need, but nothing else. For example, you know, processes that need to create folders on, on temp, um, they can do that and can access their own files, but they wouldn't be able to access files for all the processes. Uh, the same thing from data, which, for example, we use for source controller. Uh, some specific controllers, instead of starting themselves, they, they are executed via Tiny. Uh, and on those specific cases, I allow Tiny to execute those commands. Um, but for example, the majority of the binaries in the actual container, they are blocked via, yeah, and they are audited, which means, especially with Fire Primer, you have two ways, right? You can just deny things and say, look, I don't care about this, just block it. Um, but you can also do a audit deny, which means I want to know, I want an audit entry on my, you know, OS level um, logs for every time that this has, has been attempted. So I could actually give a, you know, quick uh, example of that working. Let me share my screen. Let me 
close some of the crazy things I have on my uh, lens first. So always a good way to start it. Yeah, okay, lens, let me, yeah. So for example, I have, I have applied this on most of my controllers, but not on customized because I'm still working through some things on, on the customized. The only thing I need for this work is pretty much deploy that app armor profile in the cluster and, and then for the time being, add a annotation telling, you know, Kubernetes what app armor profile I'm using, which in this case is this. So as I'm blocking any executable, if I do a pod shell there, it pretty much gets denied. Like on, on the things that actually exist that, that are denied, I won't be able to shell into this at all. And this will actually go to my audit logs um, on the host machine. If I go to customize, which I don't have that, I can literally just shell into it and it's fine. Again, the good thing about this kind of uh, thing, uh, you know, like enforcement is, is that um, first, it's a lot easier for us to support users. Um, they, we don't need to have like, you know, very tiny uh, base images. It's always good to have, but you know, like for, for someone to kind of debug an image and so on, the only thing they need to do is remove an annotation and everything's working as, as they were uh, they were before. Um, on top of that, I don't see we're shipping this by default. Like we, we can pretty much make this available and, and get folks to use, but not like, unfortunately, and, and the reason for that is unfortunately Kubernetes don't have an easy way to, to ship that this kind of thing. Um, so especially for a parameter, you need to load those profiles into the host. You can't just copy a file and that's it. So you need to do some privileged uh, um, commands in, in order to get them in place. So there are some things that do that. So for example, the security profiles operator, which I plan to get our profile shipped there once it's working 100%. Um, but in the meantime, folks would have to kind of, you know, own that moving and copying and stuff. So once it's 100%, I will share more details. I will, I will actually push that into the security profiles operator. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to kind of raise awareness about this. And if anyone wants to kind of have a play with it or, or anything, just let me know. And I'll be more than keen to support uh, the use of App Armor on our controllers. Nice. Brilliant. Um, okay, I think that was all that I wanted to cover today. Is there any other items, any anything that anyone wants to bring up, or know, talk about, complain about, ask about? Yeah, something. So uh, right now there is a job PR open. Uh, it's not that job, and it's pretty much. I think it's in a good place, but there might be a few things, but. It's in a good place. Point being, there's a PR open on the Flux2 CLI repository. And uh, so bas uh, basically what it does is it refactors the entire bootstrap process to use the new Git packages. So it gets rid of all the custom Git code that was in the CLI. And it adds support for uh, DevOps and uh, code commit as part of the bootstrap process. So I've tested it with pretty much everything. Uh, so if you look at the second column, it's I've tested pretty much everything except for Bitbucket server, because and that is being a bit. Um, this is turning out to be a bit tricky, testing it with the Bitbucket server because Bitbucket server, for some reason, the uh, GoGet providers does not like the fact that the Bitbucket server I have is served over HTTP and not HTTPS. So, so even though. I am explicitly telling it to use HTTP uh, when it tries to get like the organization or the repository using the stash API, uh, it fails. So not sure how quite to proceed here. I, I don't want to sit down and configure let's encrypt and search bot and everything for my Bitbucket server. So if there is anyone who's already running a Bitbucket server on HTTPS, that would be great. 
or is, are there any other ideas how I can test it? Yeah, one thing that you can try to do is use a main in the middle kind of proxy that you know provides HTTPS and then kind of just funnels that back into HTTP. So with that, if you know if you run that, you should be able. I think it, it creates a self-signed search locally that you can just you know um, trust. <laughs> and um, and then yeah, off off, off you go. Won't that be blocked? Won't that be blocked by default? Like a self-signed search. I think you have to tell clients to like for like for example for curl. This I know that you have to like pass in a, a flag. Telling curl explicitly to trust the self-signed source. By default, self-signed source, source certificates are untrusted, right? Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, so if you add that into your search uh, store, then your whole machine trusts that. So something is not trusted because it's not on your trust store, right? So if you have that search and you just add that, in, you know, temporarily into your local trust store, that that should just work. Um, cool. Uh, any yes, anything I, else? Oh, hello. I have a question for for Sanskar around the Bootstrap refactoring. <clears throat> Why do we yes. need a new flag? SSH host to already have a flag called host that does this. We do. Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't know which one. Uh, I don't see a host flag in the bootstrap get documentation. Come on, it's called the SSH hostname. Yeah, the SSH host, the one I added was because, so what we do is if you are trying to, let's say, bootstrap to an HTTPS endpoint, right? Uh, but you don't want to use token auth, so if you don't use token auth, use deploy keys using like an SSH, using the SSH server. So usually like if you use GitHub or GitLab, they're both their SSH and their HTTP server. So server is served on the same domain, right? Like github.com, gitlab.com. Azure, their, their HTTPS Git server is served on dev.azure.com and their SSH server is served on ssh.dev.azure.com. So when, what happens is when you try to bootstrap through HTTPS, like you do plus bootstrap git uh, URL HTTPS dev.azure.com, it will push the manifest, but when it will try to create a deploy key and like, you know, pull it to SSH, it will fail because we do a scan of the SSH server. So, and the, how we determine the, what, how, how, how we determine to run the scan is we use the host name of the git repository URL. But the Git repository URL is HTTPS. So we need this extra flag to specify like a custom SSH server to run scans. Sanskar, we have a flag called SSH minus hostname. You added a new flag called SSH minus host. Do you find this acceptable? I mean. Oh, I did not know about that. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Okay. I didn't find that in the arguments when I was going through them. And the SSH minus, minus host name, the description is SSH host name to be used when the SSH host differs from the HTTPS host, because we have this for GitLab for a very long time since the start. GitLab uses a different host name for SSH. Okay, no, I was not um, aware of that, I'm sorry. I did not find it when I went through the documentation. I must have skipped over. So this flag is common for all bootstrap commands. Yep, got it. Yeah, I, I found it just now. Found, found it? Okay. Yeah, I found it. Not bad. I'll reward that. Too. Cool. That was my my issue with the pull request. Thanks. Cool. Anything else? Anything uh, pressing that people really need to take out of their chest? I think Sunny has something yes. to tell us. I wanted to discuss about events and the concerns related to 
DDoSing because of creating also too many events. If, uh, in notification controller, we don't have we didn't have any events, Kubernetes events, and in the refactoring pull requests that's open, we are adding events. But while discussing about events, I felt that we have hesitation around events, that events can be those the API server. Like, should we be so hesitant or should we provide a flag for deployments where it can really cause an issue? We do not even think it Kubernetes events. Or do we write a documentation telling people that they can deploy an admission controller, which will stop these spammy events, protect their API server? Well, nowhere besides notification controller, we allow um, unauthorized external um, tooling or humans or whatever to do stuff on Kubernetes. Everything mm -hmm. that Flux does is behind the Kubernetes API. You need to be authorized and so on. So if you run Flux reconcile source Git, in a loop every millisecond, you're authorized to do that because the Flux CLI goes through the Kubernetes API authentication and authorization. And if an administrator decides to DDoS the hell out of a <laughs> Kubernetes API and fill it CD, that's, that's on them. But the issue with notification controller and was I was why I was very reluctant to add events to it is because once you use a receiver, you expose notification controller to the outside world and anyone that knows uh, the receiver endpoint can create massive damage to, to your cluster. So that, that's the reason I haven't added events when we started with notification controller. And this didn't change now. I haven't added events to any error resulting from a call to an external endpoint. I've added events to the, like, like you said, to normalize and have notification controller behave like all the others. I have only added events when the um, initialization or the validation of a custom resource fails. Who can create and change custom resources? Well, people who are authorized, either through the Git repository where Flux supplies them, or they they, are, uh, they go with kubectl or whatever, and they apply something on their own. Given this, I don't think we should uh, we need right now a flag to uh, you know drop Kubernetes events because my changes don't don't trigger that behavior. But if we, I don't know, when we are going to talk about receiver version one before GA, if we decide to, I don't know, issue events from HTTP calls, then definitely yes, but I'm, I don't see any reason why we should issue Kubernetes events uh, based on what's coming from outside. So in this case, it's for visibility. Unless you check the logs, you don't know that things are failing. If you yeah. put it in Kubernetes events, it will be visible in the Kubernetes context. And I would say it would be even better if we expose some metrics when some this notifications are or receivers are failing. Because log parsing, not everybody has it, but metrics most of the people have. It's easily installed for me days. We expose metrics, right? Not the, the receiver or notification metrics, right? Do we? Mm. We only have metrics for the reconciliation. No, we have custom metrics notification controller, but I I don't know if they are around rate limiting, I think.
Yes, there are some notifications that aren't really empty. So the web server is instrumented with Prometheus. And we expose HTTP metrics. So some things are caught here on the other side. But yeah, we should, uh, we could have the same uh, metrics for the receiver. So there are two servers, right? Event server and receiver server. Event server is instrumented, and we also expose dedicated metrics for uh, rate limiting. So we we instrument all we've instrumented all the calls and people can have reports based on the HTTP error code and rate limiting has its own error code. We could uh, no, no, the receiver server is also instrumented. So if the payload is not verified or whatever, when the server responds, responds with 500 or uh, 500, it's in our case, you get metrics for that. So you know that your receivers are not working correctly and you also see the URL for it. Um, I have not tried it. By looking at the URL, can you figure out which a receiver it's for? You have to search the status. I have to try, but I was thinking if we emit events on the receiver for which it's failing, it would be just easier for the And Oh yeah, now we, now we issue events when uh, when the receiver configuration is not good, let's say you have, I don't know. Initially you added the secret ref correctly, maybe then you deleted the secret or you renamed the secret key or all, all these combinations where um, the receiver cannot, uh, is not configured properly. But even with that, you can have a token and you didn't add the token to GitHub or you, I don't know. You mistyped it there. So even if the custom resource is valid, GitHub will send the payload and the verification will fail. And it will respond with 500. And then you get uh, only a metric and an error log. No Kubernetes events for that. So this is in case of receiver, which is like external thing coming inside. I was more concerned about events, which is we are trying to reach outside, but we are failing. But that is not being reported per object, right? If some Slack notification we are emitting and it fails, it's not reported anywhere, just in the log. And maybe no more tricks. Not the object for which it failed. We don't see the failure there. Yeah, of course not, because the object doesn't do anything. But object has the configuration which is being used. An object can show that when Flux tried to use it, it failed. It cannot validate the token unless it tries to post something. But whatever is posting the web server, it can uh, emit an event on the object for which the token is expired if for some reason it's failing. Not very critical, just uh, maybe better UX. We don't need to discuss now, but this decide now. Yeah, I'm not sure if events are better UX, but anyway, we've discussed this uh, uh, several times. But I, I think Gra Grafana Cloud, I think they have first class support for events.
So some people have. Yeah. But if you use Grafana Cloud, then you, you also have the all the flux logs in there because we ship with the with the login configuration for Loki. So you'll just use twice the space in Grafana Cloud because the same stuff you have in logs and in events, and you'll pay twice for that. I'm guessing people who actually use Grafana Cloud, for example, definitely want to disable events. So because of this, maybe we need a flag to say, I want logs or I want events. Because in source control and maybe other places, we are doing it twice. We are logging and emitting event at the same time. Yeah, also in Helm controller, customized controller and so on. Yeah, please create an RFC and we can uh, we can do this, of course. Uh, I'll discuss some more. <laughs> Don't really have full clarity. And then we'll see if we need an RFC. Yeah, we can create uh, an issue just to track it and then as, as things develop or a discussion either way. And as things develop, we, we create an RFC. Yeah, events uh, are, are dropped from Kubernetes by very fast, uh, depending on what you're using. Logs, not, not so much. But yeah, if you have something that listens to events and logs, we duplicate all the information. So I don't know. Stack drive you or Grafana Cloud or whatever you'll pay twice for it, which is I enabled Stack Driver on Google Cloud and the price for flux logs was um, twice as much as the whole cluster. So of course I disabled it. So um, Grafana Cloud has like 50 GB free, right? Should be enough. Uh, I have another thing to discuss. Should I? Yep. So I saw some people were trying Helm repository with OCI and a service account and authentication was failing. And somebody else came in and told them to use the spec.service account name option, which is in OCI repository. And it is that we don't have that in Helm repository because Henry Post 3 was just for the index file, but now we have OCI support. So Henry Repose 3 OCI can also have a service account for authentication. All right. OCI or image repository, they have service account name for authentication, but Henry Repose 3 doesn't have it. Yes, the way we use it today is that we have a secret where we have uh, uh, the, the authentication or otherwise we use the provider with AWS to do the contextual login. If you would have a, a service account, what Sam said, what I see is that you could use that service account that would have the authentication information when you are do an image pool sequence or when you want to to pull a Helm chart to directly from the, the repository. Yeah, so, so that service be... account name can be used for um, with any kind of provider. It's not, we don't implement, we don't implement that. It's impossible to impersonate a service account in Kubernetes and gain access to, I don't know, um, GCP, GC, GCR, ACR, and so on. The service account name are, are, will only work if you have cron jobs that generate secrets which are attached to that service account. Uh, if I understand, you mean if you have a service account attached to the source controller? You cannot use uh, the the AWS SDK to request a token to connect to ECR. That wouldn't work. Yes, of course not. Okay. So all these 
OEDC providers, what they are doing, they are mounting files inside the pod. There is no pod. Where can they mount files? Asa, the service account, service account has a full secret. And when I saw the code in OC repository, it's referring to the secret in the service account and getting the token. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? I could do that, but this does not work with the contextual login. That's what Stefan is saying, I think. Isn't it working for OCI, no? OCI repository? Uh, it would work the same way than we do today when we provide a secret. That would be another option, but that wouldn't work with context, contextual login. That's what I understand. Uh, for AWS, they have the IRSA, right? And you have to add some annotation for it. So maybe that won't work. Well, I know that um, on the um, on the Azure AKS uh, implementation back then, they were doing some authentication behind the scenes um, for authentication authorization between cluster and the ACR. I don't know if that also encompass other requests done within the cluster or if it was just the nodes. Um, but do we have uh, do you have a issue with this? that I can uh, take a look as well, or and, and also add into the agenda so other folks can refer to. Uh, I am supposed to open one, I will, just after the meeting. Cool, that would be brilliant. Oh, I cannot die. So there is a separation between context authentication and static credential authentication, right? We can't use context authorization outside of a pod, because that's how Kubernetes works. No matter what you do on the service account that you are annotated, you add labels, no matter the cloud vendor out there, the, the Kubernetes implementation is about pods, right? They create volumes, they mount secrets there, and that's how source controller context authentication works. So you need to annotate the source controller service account. And that's of course, no longer multi-tenant and so on. Yeah, when just, you specify a service account name in the OCI repository object, for example, we expect people to use cron jobs, execute AWS CLI, Azure CLI, whatever, whatever, generate static secrets, which are attached as image pool secrets to the service account. And that's very detailed in the documentation. I don't know where the, why it, we are confused now after so many, I don't know, two years of doing this because we have the same stuff in image repository. Why, why the confusion now? Helm repository doesn't have that option. Secret uh, uh, service account name. Mm -hmm. It has only secret rep. And people want secret account name, not for uh, service account and not for context authorization, for static secrets, right? Yeah, of course, we can add that. Okay, that's the confusion. Okay, clear. Yeah, so we, so no. it has nothing to do with context. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, 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 sure, we can. How did that so, escape the pull request? To you? So I, I think in the RFC, the original Helm repository RFC, it didn't have this. And I think RFC can be updated to mention this as well. Yeah, yeah, first we need to update the RFC. Uh, add service account name there on the Helm, Helm OCI RFC then create the issue, then implement it. Implementing it means adding the field and call the same function from OCI repository because it's the same stuff, right? Uh, it's nothing, shouldn't be anything different to it. Okay, that's it.
Cool. Anything else uh, anyone wants to raise or talk about? I have one last thing. Yep, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on the package on package customize. Uh, I have opened a, a pull a pull request that is in draft. I'm updating it so we can use the same M sub dependency as the customized controller and to be on par with it. And also I am adding uh I'm adding an option in the variable substitution so we can be uh, offline by offline i mean so we can we don't have to connect to the cluster to retrieve the config map and secret resources so if you do it offline what you would have is we do the variable substitution only when we provide those variables in line in the custom resource why this is because in flex diff customization people have requested uh, the ability to do it uh, uh, without the need to connect to the cluster now how the flex this uh, flex diff um, works is that we need uh, a keep config so we uh, we connect to the cluster we retrieve the resources we do a viable substitution if needed, and then we output the SSA dry one. If you do it without uh, the need to connect the cluster, we, we could do the same, and everything would be uh, done. Uh, uh, and at the end, yeah, we still have to do the SSA, but we don't have to, to retrieve the resources. Yeah, I, I've seen that. So a couple of things. Uh, Flux diff can't be used without a cluster because it's diff. Yes, the, the last uh, part, when we do the diff, we need the cluster. But for the, the substitution, we don't need the cluster, actually. Uh, so Flux diff can't work without a cluster because you are diffing with the local files against the cluster state. What you should yes. be doing, change everything here when you mention diff and replace it with build. You can't diff something if you don't have something yeah. to compare with. Exactly. Well, yeah, to be clear, we can the diff part anyway, we need the SSA dry run, but the build part, when we build everything for diffing, we can do it without the cluster connection. Yes, so your pull request will enable Flux build customization to run without having to connect to the cluster, not Flux diff customization, which by nature uh, requires the cluster state. Yeah. Yeah, this looks good. We can... Uh, can move forward with it if you rephrase what you are doing here because how is it written now makes no sense to me. Okay, I will have a look on that to make it clear. So this enable flux build customization minus minus dry run right this is what you are trying to do yeah and about this the first part uh making it on par with uh the customized controller so then you would have the same functions the same versions if the the test passes is this is an option to use it this customized controller. Mm. Is this type substitute reference used in this code or not? Because this type is not, there is no optional field in customized controller. So this will never work. 
we can't use this logic there, right? It is the same code. Because in optimized control, you have the CP2 reference in the API. And I, I copied it because I needed it uh, in the package as well. But it's supposed to be the same one. OK. Then let's move substitute reference to API's meta. So we yes. can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, for now, I, well, for now I'm testing, but yeah. Uh, can you uh, add that PR uh, into the agenda so folks can refer back to that as well? Um, is there anything else we need to talk about? I just saw that we slightly over time. Um, yeah, I want to say a couple of things about notification controllers. So I have created a new API. I added a new API package in package called event. Uh, I made some breaking changes to runtime and currently I have updated, I have switched all controllers to the new event API uh, structure that's merged and what's left to do for the, you know, for this to be complete is to merge the V1 beta 2 API in notification controller. Um, yeah, so I'm asking for reviews of 5,000 lines of code. So uh, It can look scary, but it's not that because adding the new API duplicates a bunch of things, right? But the actual code changes are not that much. I fixed a bunch of bugs, added uh, events, and I've also added some, I've added validation to all the fields in notification controller. This is... I think you should mention in the last film. No notification controller has, API has intervals now. What? <laughs> notification API objects now have interval, right? Previously, they were like static. Now they are more dynamic. They are reconciled every interval period. So that's a significant change in how the controller works. No? Yeah, it's um, we basically rerun the validation, but that will not, as we discussed before, that will capture only misconfiguration of some things. Um, which let's say is better. It adds more uh, more visibility um, when you change things which are not in spec, like the like the secret ref. Um, also, with the event API v1 beta one, I also moved all the things that were hard coded inside notification control and the various all the other controllers, things like how we signal a commit start to update and all that stuff. Um, that Hidem was complaining about. <laughs> so now everything is used for from the package. Only there, there is a metadata struct that I've added. And all the other controllers, including notification controller, are using those uh, keys. So Let's say we will at some point drop checksum and replace it with digest. We or we want to make changes to how we uh, annotate events with other information, like a Helm chart app version or things that people are asking for. Right? It's um, now it's you basically change it in a single place and uh, that should work for all the other controllers. So that's also a good improvement um, for the whole of Flux, not only notification controller. Yeah, so my ask is 
Uh, someone please review this so we can merge it and release it. Um, you signed F four three five from not a notification controller. Yes. Yeah, I added down there. It's the top of the list of the Bootstrap J focused uh, PRs. Cool. That's it from me. Brilliant. Anything else from anyone? Well, otherwise, let's call it uh, it. And um, yeah, see you guys later. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.